All right, everybody, welcome to the South Central Texas Spring 2019 Climate Outlook webinar. Today's date is Thursday, March 14th, 2019. My name is Brett Williams. I am the climate focal point here at the National Weather Service Forecast Office in Austin, San Antonio. And let's go ahead and get started. So before we jump into the spring outlook, let's take a quick review of what we saw in the winter. Uh, this right image here shows mean temperature percentiles for December through February. And you can see that pretty much the entirety of South Central Texas saw above average temperatures this past winter time. And that was largely thanks to uh, very warm overnight lows. Precipitation was more of a mixed result. This image here shows you that, the total precipitation percentiles for the winter time months. Uh, portions of the north to northeastern areas of the region saw slightly above average precipitation, uh, namely the Austin metro region and points north and east. The majority of the region was near average. And a small area here across the southwestern portion of the, of the region along the Rio Grande Plains were slightly below average for precipitation. So looking ahead to spring 2019, of course, severe weather season is here. Uh, severe weather increases through May, with May being the highest risk month for hail, wind, and tornadoes. And then this image here on the right shows you precipitation by month for Austin, Del Rio, and San Antonio. And spring is not the wettest season of the year across the region, but it is one of the wetter seasons. And May, actually, the month of May is the wettest month of the year in Austin and Del Rio, and it's the third wettest month of the year behind June and October in San Antonio. So we do have a flash flood threat, uh, especially as we head into the month of May. Let's take a look at the 90 and 180 day percent of normal rainfall as of March 14th. Top left image here shows you the 90 day percent of normal. And you can see that most areas are below normal rainfall over the last 90 days, except for a small portion of the Austin Metro here, uh, primarily Hayes, and Travis and portions of eastern Williamson County where we've been above normal over the last 90 days. But most areas are still above normal rainfall over the last 180 days thanks to September and October of last year in which we were very, very wet. The lone exception of this being highlighted here with this red circle across the Rio Grande Plains where we've been a little bit drier than normal over the last basically six months. So the drought outlook, because we've been so dry uh, lately, D0 and D1 are creeping back into the region, especially across the southwest, due to these relatively dry conditions since last November. So right now, almost half of the region is in D0 or abnormally dry, with a little over a fourth of the region, 28%, currently in moderate drought or D1, denoted by this burnt orange region right here across the southwest. But the U.S. Seasonal Drought Outlook, this is a product released by CPC, the Climate Prediction Center. They do not anticipate drought conditions to continue through the spring months. So here it shows you where we currently have drought conditions, and it shows drought removal likely. So we do not expect drought to be that big of a concern here through the spring months. So looking at the short-term outlooks here, this is the CPC Climate Prediction Center 6 to 10 and 8 to 14 day outlooks. And they generally show cooler and wetter than normal conditions in the 6 to 10 and 8 to 14 day period, uh, especially cooler than normal conditions in the 6 to day period with it trending more toward uh, near normal for the 8 to 14 day period. Uh, but in the more immediate short term, uh, we're expecting much cooler than normal temperatures for tomorrow, so Friday, uh, March 15th through Monday, and even probably in the middle to end of next week. So it looks like in the short term here, uh, we're probably going to be looking at near normal or a little bit cooler than normal temperatures. All right, so the El Nino Southern Oscillation Outlook, we currently have weak El Nino conditions present. So we have an El Nino advisory. This was released back around uh, Valentine's Day, about February 14th. Uh, equatorial sea surface temperatures shown here are above average across most of the Pacific Ocean. And actually, El Nino conditions strengthened in February. So now the pattern of anomalous convection and winds are consistent with El Nino. This was not the case prior to February, which is why even though we had the above normal temperatures in the Pacific, uh, they had not 
sent out an El Nino advisory yet because we weren't seeing that connection between these warm waters across the equatorial Pacific and the convection and the winds. Uh, but now we are seeing that connection, so we are in El Nino. And this is also a change from last month's update. Now the CPC predicts about an 80% chance for El Nino conditions to continue through spring. This is up from about 55% from the update back in February. I'm sorry, uh, yes, back in February they only showed a 55% chance of El Nino conditions to continue through spring. Uh, and now actually CPC predicts about a 60% chance of El Nino conditions to continue even through the summer months. So you can see here, uh, this is all the different forecast models or members that they use to predict El Nino or La Nina. And you can see that most of them continue El Nino conditions uh, definitely through spring and even through summer and into the fall months. Uh, one thing I will note though is that El Nino forecasts this time of year are fairly low confidence because this tends to be a transition period for El Nino. So just keep that in mind. All right, so how do we think this is going to impact our temperatures in the springtime with it being El Nino? Well, I went back and looked at 10 springs with El Nino conditions since 1950. And these are them here, uh, the spring of those 10 years in which we had El Nino conditions present throughout the entirety of the spring months. And then the mean temperatures for Austin, San Antonio, and Del Rio. Uh, comparing them to the 1981 to 2010 30-year normal period. And spring in South Central Texas is typically cooler than, than, than cooler than normal, excuse me, during El Nino, with an average temperature departure of around 1.5 degrees, uh, cooler than cooler than normal. And how does this hold up? Does this hold up most of the time? Yes, it does. At Austin, about nine out of ten El Nino springs are, have been colder than normal at Austin, with seven out of ten El Nino springs being colder than normal at San Antonio and Del Rio. When you only look at the weak El Nino events, of course, this spring uh, is likely just to be a weak El Nino. So I have the weak El Ninos uh, listed up here. Uh, the signal isn't quite as strong for weak El Nino events, but it still exists. Um, and uh, actually for Austin, it holds six out of six times in which weak El Nino springs were colder at Austin. Uh, and about two-thirds of the time, four out of six weak El Nino springs were colder at Del Rio and San Antonio. Furthermore now, this is um, an image showing you the increased risk of warmer cold extremes. And you can see a large percent increase in the risk for cold temperature extremes during the spring during El Nino conditions for South Central Texas. Furthermore, the CFS model, the Climate Forecast System model, this is a mid to long range model that can help shed some light on what we're going to be uh, possibly looking at here over the next few months. Uh, this is the seasonal uh, two meter temperature anomaly for April, May, and June. And it shows a slight negative temperature anomaly uh, for April through June for portions of the region, primarily the western half of the region, suggesting near neutral for the remainder of the region, the eastern half. Uh, so with all this information I've just showed the last few slides, my best guess is that temperatures this spring will be near or slightly below normal. So how about for rainfall? What's our rainfall outlook look like with this being a weak El Nino spring? Again, I looked at uh, the 10 springs with El Nino conditions throughout the entirety of the spring months, uh, looking at total precipitation at Austin, San Antonio, and Del Rio. And spring in South Central Texas tends to be wetter than normal during El Nino. Uh, the average of El Nino springs uh, is wetter than normal for Austin, San Antonio, and Del Rio. You can see the departure from normal here. So plus 2.85 at Austin, plus 2.35 at San Antonio, and plus 1.05 at Del Rio. Uh, and again, how often does this hold true for? Well, at Austin, it holds 6 out of 10 El Nino Springs wetter than normal at Austin, as well as San Antonio. And then 7 out of 10 El Nino Springs have been wetter than normal at Del Rio. Now, the signal isn't quite as strong when you just look at weak El Nino events, but it still does exist. However, this is partly uh, skewed by 2015, which was a weak El Nino spring in which Austin, San Antonio, and Del Rio all saw um, well, well, well above average rainfall. Of course, this was the uh, Memorial Day weekend 2015 event along the Blanco River in Wimberley. Uh, that was May of 2015 during this weak El Nino spring. So it still exists, but the signal isn't quite as strong, uh, and it holds about... 50% of the time at Austin in which weak El Nino springs are wetter than normal. Uh, only two out of the six at San Antonio did it hold and four out of six uh, did it hold at Del Rio. So this was some research done uh, when 
They looked at historical March through May El Nino precipitation patterns across the continental United States. And you can see here that most of the region, about the northern two-thirds of the region, uh, showed um, a, an increase in precipitation during uh, El Nino springs. Again, let's take a look at what the CFS model suggests, and it suggests above normal rainfall for April through June for South Central Texas. Uh, in some cases, uh, a pretty strong signal to above normal, especially across the eastern half or so of the region. So how about spring severe weather outlook? So research suggests that uh, El Nino conditions in the spring typically correlate to a lower frequency of tornado and hail events across south central Texas. So on the left is the El Nino influence, top left is on tornadoes, and bottom left is on hailstorms. And you can see generally there are less, uh, uh, fewer events, less frequent events for tornadoes and hailstorms across south central Texas during El Nino. Local research of local CERN reports seems to su support this. Uh, we've seen fewer severe weather reports during El Nino Springs uh, compared to La Nina and to Neutral, and that holds across the board for uh, all severe hazards, tornado, hail, and wind. Uh, there is a caveat here, though. We have a pretty low sample size of El Nino Springs in which we've uh, taken storm reports, and there are inherent issues with just using storm reports alone as a proxy, but in general, uh, this would tend to support that uh, theory that we see less severe weather during El Nino Springs. However, I will say that the CFS is hinting at the possibility of a brief period of active weather in mid-April across the region. Uh, the CFS isn't always you know, super accurate on uh, predicting severe weather that far out, but uh, it is something to uh, keep an eye on. All right, and the flash flooding outlook, uh, this is the increased risk of wet or dry extremes, similar to the image I showed you earlier looking at the increased risk of uh, cold or warm extremes. And you can see a moderate to a large percent increase in the risk for extreme wet events in the spring across South Central Texas during El Nino. So you may be thinking, well, why do we have a lower risk for severe weather but a greater risk for above normal rainfall? Well, think of it as with El Nino we see uh, favored toward more warm rain and widespread heavy rainfall events. So think of like mesoscale convective systems, more of your tropical air mass events when you see uh, really efficient rainmakers and really heavy rain events, and less severe weather setups that would favor supercells that would produce more hail or tornadoes, etc. So what does CPC uh, think we're going to see this spring for temperatures and precip? Now this outlook is a little bit outdated. It was produced on February 21st, so it's a few weeks old now, and this was before we saw El Nino conditions actually strengthening. Um, so I would anticipate them to produce a new one pretty soon here, but uh, for this outlook created a few weeks ago, they showed no strong signal for temperatures either way for March, April, and May, so about even chances for above or below normal temperatures. Uh, but for precip, they did show odds tilted toward above normal precipitation for March, April, and May. So the spring fire weather outlook, again, earlier I had mentioned that we had D0 and D1 returning to the Rio Grande Plains and the Southern Edwards Plateau, which of course is a concern. The greater the drought conditions, typically that correlates to more of a uh, fire weather concern. Uh, however, with that being said, this is the calculated soil moisture anomaly uh, as of a couple days ago. And you can see that across South Central Texas, uh, our soil moisture levels are still pretty elevated, which is good news. And furthermore, the energy release component remains below average across the region. So this is the energy release component graph for the Central Texas region. And this is the energy release component graph for the Hill Country region. You can see that we are currently a little bit below average, which is good news. And the National Interagency Fire Center predicts near normal or below normal significant wildland fire potential for the spring. So this is that graphic for April. Uh, I will say that uh, it does show above normal uh, fire potential for Valverde County, so across our far, far western portions of the region for April. And then looking at May, you can see that about the southern half of the region is below normal for uh, wildland fire potential, with the rest of the region at around normal. But with that being said, we could see brief periods of elevated to critical fire conditions behind strong dry cold fronts in which you have a pairing of high winds and low relative humidities. 
So wrapping everything up now with the impacts outlook summary. Uh, temperatures, I didn't have that on the slider bar here since we typically don't really have that many impacts for temperatures during the spring months. But I just did, I just wanted to kind of hammer home that point that we're expecting probably near or slightly below normal temperatures this spring. For heavy rainfall, flash flooding, and river flooding, went ahead and hedged to expecting above normal impacts due to antecedent moderate to high soil moistures, uh, the likelihood of wetter than normal conditions this spring, and the higher risk of extreme precipitation events during El Nino. Uh, another thing I will say is that uh, there is a blog post that I saw today from somebody from the Climate Prediction Center drawing some similarities between this spring and the spring of 2015 in terms of the, the way that El Nino is developing and evolving. Um, so uh, that another, another thing that kind of went to hedging above normal for heavy rain and flash flooding, river flooding, um, of course, spring of 2015 was very wet and had some historic flooding across the region. So uh, that was something that was interesting to see. So I'll have to see how that evolves here as we head through the spring months. And as far as severe weather is concerned, expecting near or slightly below normal impacts due to severe weather. Of course, it only takes one high impact event uh, to have a, a big impact on the region. But in general, expecting near or slightly below normal impacts from severe weather. And then for fire weather, expecting slightly below normal impacts from wildland fires due to above normal rainfall and near normal to slightly cooler than normal temperatures expected this spring. But again, periods of elevated to critical fire conditions will still exist. So that concludes the webinar. Uh, if anybody has any questions, you're free to ask now. You can also contact us at this line right here. This is the public line that comes into our office. You can email me directly or visit our website at weather.gov slash Austin or weather.gov slash San Antonio. Thank you, everybody.